probably getting tired of hearing it, so I'm not going to spend a long time on it, but I'm going to preach out of it. And uh, reading the Gospels again. As a matter of fact, I read the Gospel of John today. And, uh, you know, you see, of course, the four Gospels, a, a lot of the miracles and a lot of the stuff are repeats. When I was in college, they called three Gospels the Synoptic Gospels. Do you know what they are, which ones they are? Matthew what? Yeah, that's what's not God. Why'd they call them that? They, they say a lot of the same stuff. Yeah, yeah, they have a lot of the same miracles. John, John has some of them too, but uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar in covering all the miracles, and that's why they gave them the name Synoptic Gospels. Uh, John's kind of different. I like John better personally. I'd rather read the Gospel of John than the rest of them. I like all of them. But uh, I've just got a little thought that uh, I gathered in reading through it again. Three of the passages will come out of the book of Matthew, which I read yesterday. And uh, one of them will come out of the book of John. You know, we worry about things. We worry about, you know... Is the Lord going to take care of us here? And, you know, is the, sometimes you get the feeling, I know I get the feeling sometimes, that, you know, I make jokes about it, and I am joking, I don't really believe this, but sometimes you feel like the Lord's forgot where you are. You ever feel that way, kind of? And uh, feel like you're kind of, uh, uh, not, just, 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 you're on the back burner or something, you never are, but you feel that way sometimes. And when you read the Gospels, you see a lot of awesome things in it. But one of the things you see is what we call the sovereignty and providence of God and the attributes of God because Jesus was and is God. Matter of fact, I was at my house. Brenda, what day did the, what day did the JWs come by? Was it yesterday or yesterday? Two uh, Jehovah Witnesses <laughs> came by my house. That's really unusual. We don't... Where I live at, you have to come see me on purpose. We don't get many, we don't get many knocks on the doors where I live at. And uh, and there's two men. I knew what they were when I went to the door. And there was uh, two black gentlemen, and they had their little pamphlet in their hand. And I, I walked the door and said, hey, "Can I help you?" And they said, "Yeah, we want. We're interested in talking about the Bible with you." And I don't spend a lot of time with them, church. To be honest with you, because the reason I don't, I used to. Uh, but they're so brainwashed and they're so trained. I, mean, I, try to, I, I try to give them some scripture and enough that the Holy Spirit might can use something to speak to them. But I don't spend a long time with them or a lot of time trying to convert them or nothing. And the guy said to me, he said, uh, what is your religion? I said, well, I don't really have a religion. I said, I'm a, I'm a Baptist pastor, matter of fact. I'm a independent Baptist pastor over in Bogart and they said well you know we believe in Jesus and I said yeah you do yeah you do and uh, they kind of shook their heads and, and walked right into it and I said but do you believe in him like we do well you know we may have more in there what they're trying to do is get you to talk to him. we may have more in common than you think we do I said really and I said there's one major question I want to ask you there's one just one, an answer. He said, well, okay. I said, do you believe Jesus Christ is God? Well, now, you know, no, 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 no. Don't be like a Democrat now. Answer the question. I said, do you believe Jesus Christ was and is God? Equal with the Father. And equal with the Holy. Well, they can't answer. He, uh, well, yeah, they got the same purpose. I said, no, no, no. I said, uh, that the question is, do you believe Jesus is God? I said, I just got through reading the book of Matthew today where he said he was God about 20 times. I mean, I mean, really, he did. I mean, the Pharisees kept asking him, you know, uh, where'd you come from? And who's your father? And well, what are you talking about? And Jesus just kept saying, well, I just came to my father. He's the one that sent me. You know what I mean? And, and he and I are equal. We're one. Anyway, anyway, it just, and they, they, uh, they stayed a little bit. And 
The one guy was a little, he, 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 uh, he wanted to argue a little bit, and they normally don't much with it. I ain't bragging. When they find out you're a Baptist pastor, most of the time they don't want to talk to you much. Because I hate to say this, they prey on the ignorance of people. That's what they do. See, that, that statement that he made to me, it's a smart statement to make. We believe in Jesus too. Well, see, if a person didn't know the difference, that would open a door. Well, you know, maybe there's not that much difference between us. Well, I mean, and I said to him one day, I wasn't being sarcastic. I said, the devil believe in Jesus. He said, yeah. I said, yeah. They don't believe in him like we do. And, uh, but anyway, I was just thinking about it. And uh, that was, they come every, every few years. We'll, uh, last time it was two ladies that came. And uh, what, what is sad is, every time they leave, I think of this thought. Here they are with no truth, but dedicated to getting it out. Here we are with truth, and not very dedicated to getting it out. That's, that's what's sad. I mean, they, when they go visiting, one of them told me one time, they go all day. They start like at 10 o'clock in the morning, and they go for dark. And they, they'll cover a whole area or whatever. And, and what's sad is, what's sad, they're going to go to hell probably. What's sad is, they're going to, those two men that, that came to my house trying to convert me and help me, if they don't receive Jesus as their Savior, they're going to die and go to hell. And that's just saying. But anyway, by the providence and sovereignty of God, what we believe is God is over and ultimately in control of everything. Um, and then we, we, we believe that the Gospels are full of, of the theological term, the attributes of God. Now, preacher, what is the attributes of God? Well, it's his characteristics that, that makes him different. Uh, number one, he's omnipresent. What does that mean, preacher? He's everywhere. The Bible says in Psalm 139, if I make my bed in hell, thou art there. So, so, so God is everywhere. He can be everywhere. He's omniscient. What does that mean? That means he knows everything. And how many times did Jesus in the Gospels, it's just funny, I mean, he would, he would make statements and and they'd be thinking things, not even saying them. But Jesus would know what they were thinking. Right. And, and, and he addressed the issue. Because he's omniscient. He's, he's omnipresent. And then he's omnipotent. What does that mean, for preacher? That means he's all-powerful. So he has all power. He has all knowledge. And he's everywhere. Now keep this in mind. I gave Jerry Rogers, I heard a few weeks ago. The devil is not that. The devil is not omnipresent. The devil is not omniscient. And he's not omnipotent. Okay? He does have great power. He does have great knowledge. And he can be and get to a lot of places. When he answered the Father in Job, he said, I've been going to and fro the earth. So he can be a lot of places. But he's not like Jesus and God. He's not omnipresent. He's not omniscient. And he's not omnipotent. Jesus was and is. So as I was reading through the Gospels, I was thinking today, I was here at the church a few hours, and I was thinking about you know, what to preach on. Just, just, I want the Lord to just you know, give me a thought and everything. And Because uh, you know, if you're not careful as a preacher, you'll say, well, the bigger crowd Sunday morning, so get your best sermons ready. And I think that's wrong. I, I, I think you should have a good sermon ready and a good thought every time we have church. Amen. Whether it's Sunday morning, <laughs> Sunday night, Wednesday night, or whatever. You know, I mean, there ain't 200 of you here, but there's 25 or 30 here or whatever. Uh, and if one person gets help, it's worth it. Somebody say amen, amen there. Amen. So anyway, I want to just read you some passages. And I want to explain them a little bit. Not, not a lot. It's going to be a short message. Just uh, The thought is, was that Jesus knew everything. And he would, he would arrange things according to that. And I could went to more passages. Turn, if you will, please, first to Matthew 17. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17. Now, this is a little story that I've talked about recently a couple of times. 
believe it or not, it's, it's a small miracle compared to, I mean, walking on water and feeding the 5,000 and, you know, the Red Sea and all that stuff, quote unquote, seems bigger. But this one really shows me something. In Matthew 17, verse 24, and when they were come to Capernaum, and I told you the other day that if you notice, 11 of the miracles that Jesus did uh, was in Capernaum. By the way, I was reading that book on miracles again today, and I, I, I found this one. You know, Peter is involved in eight of the miracles. The Apostle Peter is directly or indirectly involved in eight of the 33 miracles. The Sea of Galilee is involved six of the miracles. Peter and the Sea of Galilee is involved in five of them together. So, so Matthew 17, verse 24 says, And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? Now let's go back to that phrase, tribute money. And I looked it up today. And uh, I looked it up today. And what, 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 these taxes they're talking about here, there's a little bit you need to know about them. They were not Roman taxes. They were not government taxes. <coughs> Tribute money was religious taxes. And, be honest with you, watch this now. And most people, most leaders, religious leaders back then, never had to pay it. Technically, you can make them, but but they they never did hardly. So and what and, and the money matter of fact. Let me show you something. The tribute money was religious taxes, and not just religious taxes. You know what it was used for? To take care of the temple. That's what it was for. Uh, and it, was, it should have been honestly a good, legitimate tax, but of course they abused it like. Like everybody else does, you, you, you know. But anyway, uh, and, and, and what they do here, this is late in Christ's ministry, and it's amazing that they had to get mad and get ready to kill him before they finally asked this question. Because they could have asked it in Matthew 1 or 2, but they didn't ask it to Matthew 17. So they say to him here, doth your, doth, he asked Peter, doth not your master pay tribute? Now again, that was religious tax to help with the temple and the synagogues. And the common people paid it, but the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes didn't. They technically were supposed to, but now they're getting technical in Christ here. That's why I said, told you that. In verse 25, it goes on to say, he, Peter said, yes. You know Peter, he answered for he knew it, really. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him saying, what thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Verse 26. Not Peter saith unto him, of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, then are the children free. Otherwise, you know, I really wouldn't have to pay this, but, but, but we're going to. In verse 27, watch this now. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them. You know, sometimes, I hope you know this by now, everybody sitting out here. I hope you know by now that there are right things, wrong things that you don't do or you do do. Then there's things you don't do because they just may offend somebody that you don't need to, it's not necessary either way. And so it's just, the old adage is, cut every avenue off you can. Okay? So Jesus said, well, they've asked me about it, so where we don't offend them, go down to the sea and cast a hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find the piece of money that take and give unto them for me and thee. Now, do you know what the chances are? Now, this is legitimate odds done by an odds-making company. Do you know what the odds were of you walking out to the Sea of Galilee and catching one fish or certain fish? Don't we know what the odds really were? 
27 million to one. If you know anything about odds, that's almost impossible. But see, I told you the thought tonight is he does the impossible. Mm -hmm. Now how did Jesus know which fish it was? How did he know it was in his mouth? How did he know where to catch it? Remember I told you about his attributes, Brother Joe, some of you already came in late. I, I talked about the attributes of God. And that means God is omniscient. He knows everything. That means he's omnipotent. He has all power. And he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. And Jesus was and is God. Mm -hmm. So think about the miracle of this. I mean, they come up and say to him, Hey, Peter, does your master pay tribute tax? Peter said, well, he didn't, you know, Peter, he didn't think about it, didn't even ask Jesus. He said, yes. Yes, my Lord's going to pay you what he should pay. And then Jesus talks to him, and then Jesus said, well, go down to the, go down to the sea, cast your hook, take up the fish that first cometh up. Let me tell you, I, 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 that, that gave me a story I was thinking about, Brother Joe. Um, Brenda's uncle, Ted, had a little old catfish pond that was probably, it was, uh, I don't know, it would be, would it be as big as one of these sections, Brenda, like over here? Would it be probably not quite that big? And he had big old giant catfish in it, and, but he wouldn't let you catch them and keep them. That's why they kept getting bigger and bigger, you know, because when you're in a little pond, you didn't know this, people think bigger fish are in bigger ponds, but actually, <coughs> When it comes to catfish and bass, if you've really got a smaller pond, they'll really get bigger in a smaller pond because they'll eat everything else. That's what they do. The big ones eat the little ones. That's how it works out. But we were trying to catch this one fish. He had an albino catfish. Albino catfish is a white catfish. You ever seen one of them? Have you? They're white. You don't never see albino catfish. That's really, really, I've only seen, Brenda's uncle had some up in, didn't your daddy have some too, Brenda, in his pond? Yeah, your daddy, uh, her daddy had a couple of albino catfish. We were trying to catch that albino catfish in a little old bitty pond. And we never could. But Jesus tells Peter, go down to the sea and throw your hook out there and you'll catch a fish and pull him in, open his mouth up, and there'll be a coin in his mouth. It'll be just enough money to pay our tribute tax. Now, you're looking funny at me like, that's a big miracle to you. Pretty big. You know why it is? Because it shows me his omniscience again. It shows me that Jesus isn't limited like we are. Amen. That Jesus can do things we can't do. That Jesus knows things we don't know. I'm telling you, if you read the gospel over and over again, he knew exactly what they were thinking. He knew exactly what they were doing every time. How about the story in John 4 that Brother Jesse preached on a few weeks ago where the Bible said he must needs go through Samaria. But why did he have to go through Samaria? Because he wanted to see that woman. And he knew she was going to be there. And he said, Preacher, how does that help me? If you've got to ask that, you're not thinking right now. So if Jesus can do something like this for Peter, that, that's a 27 million to one odd gap. Now I'm telling you, that's, that's gigantic, humongous odds. I mean, it, it's impossible, basically. 27 million to one. I mean, if you, if you bet one dollar, you win 27 million. That's how big the odds are. But if Jesus can do that, then he can take care of us, can't he? Amen. Huh? Then he can direct our paths, order our steps. He can put in our... I'll tell you something that happened the other day. Uh, last week, matter of fact, I was going down to Covington and I was on Interstate 20 just riding down the road with my truck. And uh, first time I'd been out to do what I was doing in a long time. 
And I just had my cell phone next to me, and of course I bought one of them things where I can talk legal on it. You plug it in, radio 89.5, and I can talk through the stereo to you. So uh, if I can find it, I'm going to plug it in. Now you got to find it, amen? So I started putting it in there where I have got to be hunting it when somebody calls me. But I was riding down the road, and I said, well, I'm not going to listen to the radio. I'm not going to listen to the Bible right now. I'm just going to pray. Now, I, I, I can't tell you who and everything because I just can't. But I started praying for a person in, in my family. And, and, I, and I just, I prayed for him for about five minutes riding down the expressway. And I finished the prayer, and I went on to something else. And my phone rang. And it was then. And you've got to understand, they never called me. I'm talking about never. Hardly ever, if not never. And I just prayed for them. And the phone rings. And I said, hello, and it's them. And I'm going to tell you something. That might not mean nothing to you. <coughs> but Joe, that meant something to me. Amen. And see, Jesus can do that, folks. I mean, I look at you and how y'all got here in the church, each one of you. I guarantee you're not here by accident. I guarantee you talk to somebody, you run into somebody, you saw somebody, you heard somebody that ended up you getting here. Is that right? Well, who set that up? I believe Jesus did. So now turn to Matthew 21. We're out of Matthew 17. Let's go to Matthew chapter 21. And let's look at another situation. Just really shows nothing but his omniscience. The Bible says in verse 1 of Matthew 21, it said that when they drew nigh to Jerusalem, were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus to disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if any man say all unto you, <coughs> ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And straightway, he will send them. Now folks, why did, he hadn't been there where that cold was. He didn't know these folks but the job. He, he just said, go over here and there'll be a coat tied, an ass tied, and just start taking them if somebody says something to you, just tell them the Lord needs them. Now, 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 now keep reading. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold thy king cometh unto thee meek and setting upon an ass and a colt and a colt the full of an ass. And Jesus and the disciples went as Jesus commanded them and brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes and set him there on. His omniscience again. Matthew 26. Matthew 26. And I'm just picking out, there, there's, there's boatloads in the gospel. There's boatload more of these. I don't know why I sweat so much when I'm up here. I don't sweat this way in no other place. I'm nervous or hot or something up here. Matthew 26, and let's go down to verse number. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Verse 17. Verse 17. Yeah. Verse 17. Now, the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And Jesus said, Go into the city to such a man. And say unto him, The Master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house. 
with my disciples. In another gospel, this story, it, it says, go to the town and there'll be a man with a pitcher, bearing a pitcher, a pitcher to carry water in. And you'll walk up to him and say, we won't, we won't have supper in your house. And they go and do it. And that's where the last supper was at. I mean, Jesus just said, go over to the city, there'll be a man with a pitcher in You'll ask him about it, and he'll say yes, and go get it ready, and we'll, we'll have the pastor, we'll have the last supper. It's Jesus again, knowing everything. I mean, I mean, I mean, this 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 might not be impressing you much, but it impresses me like crazy. Because I start looking back at my life, Brother Todd, and I start thinking, you know, I start thinking, Brother Bobby. I start thinking about the people I met that I really probably shouldn't have met, that Jesus had me meet them. I think of circumstances that I, I, I was thinking about Tony Shirley today. I, I would have probably never met Tony Shirley if I wouldn't have went to San Diego. And I wouldn't have went to San Diego if Shane Hill wouldn't have called me on one Sunday night and say, we're having a guy named Doug Fisher preach tomorrow at my church, you want to come? And that's why I met Doug Fisher. And then he talked about going out there in February and I met Tony Shirley. And then on Jesse Bragg. He's out of Tony's church. We didn't even know each other years ago. We were down there at Dollar praying beside each other. I think he knows what he's doing. Amen. I think he does. Adrian Rogers calls it divine intersections. Otherwise, God gets you to a place at a certain time, and he gets somebody else at a place at a certain time for his cause. Amen. Amen. I mean, you know, I mean, I I've talked about it a lot, but. Jimmy, Jimmy was out there in the park in the yard and I talked to her and she talked to her dad and mom and Al Page and Amen. I mean, and I shouldn't have been there that day because I had already visited the bus route. And I'd already got in my car and then got eight, eight or nine miles down 316 going back to where I lived then in Lawrenceville. And the Lord reminded me that I forgot this little boy. I didn't see this little boy in the trailer park. So I said, well, I, you know, Lord, I could see him tomorrow. But then I said, no. So I turned around, made a U-turn, went back in the trailer park, saw the little boy, Jeffrey. On my way out, there was Miss Jimmy. That's a divine appointment. And we have them. And you say, well, 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 well what should that do for a trailer? It should build your faith. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking what the, about the way I met my wife. I shouldn't have met her that night. I mean, it really shouldn't have worked out. I had done said no to my mom four times. I was going somewhere because my mom had set me up with a girl one time. Jesus saved. <laughs> I met a girl one time at Biff Burger, son. Oh, help. I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm not good looking. But we didn't go nowhere to beat a burger, and I left. So I said, Mama, your idea of good looking and mine is different. So I had it set up that night to go up with a couple more guys at the cottage. But one of them called me at 4.30 and see, my car's in the shop. My, my car was, my little truck was in the shop. So, so uh, Mike Norman called me and said, Ed, I can't go tonight. He said, I got to work late. And I said, okay, well, he's the one that had the vehicle. We was all going to ride on Mike Norman. <coughs> so I told Mama, I'll go in there and get a free hot dog. I met my wife. I mean, you can look at your life and just see. You can look at your life and see those intersections yeah. where the Lord just puts you there and he put somebody else there. I mean, uh, the, two, the two businessmen in Minnesota that paid $50,000 to 
to pay for half of our property we're meeting on. I've never met him, never seen him, never talked to him. One of our men went to Minneapolis for a business luncheon and did a presentation of a company he owned. He, he met with two brothers, two, two Catholic brothers, unsaved. When he got ready to leave, he said to them, you know guys, he knew this took the rich both of them. He just point blank said to them, y'all got plenty of money. And I'm going to a little church down there in Walkersville, Georgia, trying to buy some property. Why don't y'all just give us some pay for it, give us some money. Now he really said to me, and he told me many times, he said, I said that, got on the plane, came back home, thought nothing ever happened from it. He got back home, not back in the answer machine days, remember them? He pushed the button and he said, hey, Mr. Powell, this is Mr. Johnson, I remember his last name. You know, me and my brother and I talked about that recommendation, you, that idea you had. Call us back. So Brother Powell called him and he said, how much is the land? He said, well, it's $98,000. He said, well, what if we pay $50,000? Now, the business luncheon, Brother Ken Powell said, was a flop. They didn't, they didn't buy into his company. Nothing happened. He spent $400 for nothing, he said. But Jesus had it set up. Amen. See, that, that's what you've got to... And, and you know, we could probably take time right now with every one of you here probably and say, how did y'all get here? Or how did y'all meet to get married? Or how did you... And you're going to see one day that is divine intersections and appointments. Bobby Fisher, you know, of course he was an idiot of a person, but and had major issues, I know, but he was a phenomenal chess player. I think what he the first one that beat the Russians, I believe, they said or whatever, they said they could never be beaten. Bobby Fisher beat the Russian master. And, but I remember one day I was watching an interview with him. And the, the interviewer was talking to Bobby Fisher, and he said, well, Mr. Fisher, he said, uh, tell me how you go into a match thinking. He said, well, I always tell everybody I play before I play. I tell them your first move is the last move that you're determined to make. I will dictate the rest of your moves because I am sovereign over the chessboard. Now, he wasn't, nobody is, but he was close. And what he meant by that was, he played one guy, and I remember this story, this one guy was from Germany, and he supposedly came up with this, this, this uh, set of moves that had not been beaten in 88 matches. And they started playing, and the third move, Bobby Fisher said to him, you're dead in the war. Oh, no, and I don't think so. He said, oh, yeah, he said, uh, just make your next move. It'll be your last one. Four moves he beat him. Four moves. He, he, the guy moved me, he said, checkmate. Now, I, I think of that because it's how God is. It's how Jesus is. I mean, could you imagine being the devil sometimes? Because the devil hates God and hates us and wants to destroy and hurt and he, he, he lives through the negativity and discouragement and doubt and, and he, he, he causes pain and he causes people to do terrible things and he looks so bad and so dark and like it's not going to work out and God just takes it and turns it around. Amen. I mean like Joseph, like I said Sunday. I mean Joseph said to his brothers, well y'all meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So I, I, I was just encouraged as I read the Gospel of Matthew yesterday by these three passages that Jesus is omniscient. That he knows everything. Nothing. Curtis Hudson used to say this and I've heard others say it since then but I think the first person I ever heard say this was Curtis Hudson. He said, has it ever occurred to you that nothing's ever occurred to God? The Bible says Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. In Genesis 3.15, God's word said, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. He's talking about Jesus. 
That's what Genesis 3.15 is talking about. Yeah. And they fought him. Oh my Lord, they fought him. I mean, how many times did it make this statement in the Gospels? I mean, I, I don't know the exact amount. But how many times when you read the Gospel does it say, and they sought to kill him and stone him? But he got away. And that's what it says sometimes. It don't even explain how. It just says he just, they couldn't do it. I mean, they went to hear him sometimes for the purpose of taking him and killing him. And Jesus would just say, what are they going to say? And just left out. And then, how am I going? Where's he at? Where'd he go? Went where he needed to. Went where he wanted to. Amen. How he wanted to. Amen? You know, I, I never noticed, but my guy never noticed in that story about walking on the water and, and disciples and Peter and all. I had never noticed that the Bible said when he walked in the boat, they was immediately on the shore. Mm -hmm. Now, they was in the middle of the lake in a storm. But when he got on the boat, boom, they were on the shore. You said, you believe he moved the boat? Yeah. yeah. Why? Because he can. Because yeah. he could. Because he did. So I'm just saying when you, when, when you just when things aren't just when things aren't just lining up when things aren't just you know happening the way you, you, you want it to or think it should and you don't know what's going on keep in mind Jesus knows Amen. and keep in mind if you just depend on him and talk to him and spend time with him then you'll be fine you'll be fine and I know that's easier said, and, and I'm preaching this to me again, because you say, well, preacher, you're a pastor of 40-something years. You have a lot of faith. You, you don't know me much. I probably doubt much as anybody does. I whine a lot. Oh, Lord. What? Man, I mean, Lord, I mean, come on. And Jesus just... So it takes care of things. Because he will. He will. The man that led me to Christ was a man that led my papa to Christ in South Georgia. And my mama to Christ in South Georgia. And I'm laying in room 176 at St. Luke's Hospital. And he's just became the pastor in Jacksonville at Springfield Baptist. And he's down visiting one of his members. <clears throat> and he walks around the corner because he got lost. He shouldn't even have came by my room. He was a new pastor in Jacksonville. It's a real big hospital. And he's walking around trying to find his way out. He didn't get lost. <laughs> my mom was standing outside the door. And Jerry McLeod walked around the corner and he kind of went, Winifred Strickland. She said, J.O. McLean. He said, what are you doing here? She said, I live here. What are you doing here? She said, my son's in her rheumatic fever. He's sick. Edwin, he's in there. He'd been here for 20-something days. He said, your oldest son? He said, yeah. He said, well, I remember him vacation Bible school in South Georgia. The same man that led my papa to Christ. Led my mama to Christ. And led me to Christ. You know how many years was the difference of those three? Forty years. Thirty years. Thirty years. From 42 to 72. He led Papa to Christ in 42, Mama to Christ in 52, and me to Christ in 72. Three different areas. He led my Papa to Christ on the back of the field, led my Mom to Christ in Red Cross, Georgia, and led me to Christ in Jacksonville, Florida. Good figure. That's, that's a story. Amen. That's unique. Yeah. Yeah. I sat on the couch. I down. I closed with this one. How many of y'all, did any of y'all remember my buddy from Florida, Jim Lyle? He came up one time and preached for us. Yeah. 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 Sir? Yeah. Is he really? Well, Jim is different. Jim is just, just leave it at that. First time I went down to gym, me and Brennan went down there. Brennan, you remember he had us down there to preach, heard saying me to preach. Now he, he was in a, what was the, uh, 
by Disney World. Captain Dundee, Dundee, Florida. Yeah, yeah. Both it's Haines City, it's Orlando, Kissimmee, Haines City, Dundee, on down the road. So he uh, took me out to eat chicken, and he had a Corvette. He took, he took, took the top down. We rode down the road 90 miles an hour in a Corvette, so, with no top on. I had hair back then. It's flying everywhere. Well, last night I'm sitting here and asked my wife, I'm sitting there, now listen, Brother Tony, I hadn't called Jim, I hadn't talked to Jim, how long, Brenda? I mean, 10, 15 years since he came here. Probably the last time I talked to him. And I'm sitting on the couch and I'm watching the Monday night, and I'm watching the Steelers and the Buccaneers play football. And I got to think about it. that's where he used to live out in Tampa down there. Dundee's right next to Tampa. It's like 25 miles from Tampa. And I said, you know, I wonder what Jim Lyle's doing. And, uh, and I don't have his number no more. And I asked the Lord to help me remember it. Because I can memorize the numbers pretty good, but I have to call him every now and then. Don't you? And the number came right to me. I mean, 86. And I dialed it. He's so crazy. His voicemail said, you've reached Pastor Jim. He's 80 years old. He said, you've reached Pastor Jim Lyle. He said, if you're calling about our senior event, leave a message. If you're one of them dumb robocalls, don't leave nothing. Because <laughs> I'm not calling you back. And that, that was his voicemail, you know. But I talked to him. We just got to talking. I, I close this. And he said, you remember how we met? I said, yeah, Larry Brown's in North Augusta. You know how we met? My car broke down. He picked me up on the side of the road. Our car broke down. He picked me up. He gave me a ride around there to take me. And then he had a mechanic with him that fixed my car. That's how we met. We would probably never have met. See, it's divine intersections and divine appointments. Yeah, it is. So just hang in there if things ain't working out right. He has some divine appointments for you. Amen. 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 I believe that. Let's stay. Let's stay.